What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 2, the full season out now on Disney+. Plus. Pretty good season. Had a good time with it. You know, I think The Bad Batch, it's not the most consequential Star Wars show we get every year. Obviously, the live action shows get more attention. But Bad Batch is another solid, I think, enjoyable entry in the Star Wars animated history and stable that we've had for several years at this point. And I think it largely does a good job at its key goal. And I think as long as you understand what the like the goals of this show are, then you can probably enjoy it. Bad Batch is really just kind of coloring in the Star Wars lore and is like one of those like for the fan shows. You know, it's not going to be the most moving show there is, although I thought there was plenty of emotional resonance in season two. You have to kind of almost be excited about this show weaving in various Star Wars stories and filling stuff in that doesn't necessarily need to be filled in to most people, but for people that are interested in it, they'll enjoy this quite a bit. You know, um, I think the show is pretty successful in that regard. Now, 16 episodes. Some of these episodes, I think, are really thrilling and moving, the ones that are much more serialized and pushing the plot forward. You also have these more traditional episodes, the more uh, case of the week, mission of the week stuff. Now, where the plot ended up with the Batch being betrayed by Sid, they'll probably stop running missions for her, and maybe season three is the final season. It's a really like plot-heavy season, the way Rebels wrapped up with season three. Who can say? I'm certainly rooting for that. But even the more you know casual stuff, the one-off episodes, I think are a lot of fun. You get you know, like something cool like Gunji, the Wookiee Padawan from Clone Wars coming back, surviving Order 66. Do we need to know about Gunji's fate? Of course not. It's just cool to spend time with that. That being said, I think the more consequential stuff uh, really stood out to me. So early on, we had episode three, The Solitary Clone. I thought that was a really strong episode, you know, bringing back Commander Cody, seeing Cody go AWOL and Crosshair start the question of the Empire. I think that was really impactful episode and really tied into some of the other uh, key themes that continue throughout the season you know episode seven and eight you know the clone conspiracy and truth and consequences that whole arc about what's going to happen to the clones what is the empire going to do about the clones having a senator senator pushing for clone rights that is like a cool piece of star wars history star wars lore for people that are into it you know similar to season one kind of giving you resolution on what happened to the Kaminoans, what happened to Kamino. Again, it's not like the most crazy thing to answer or explain, but you're just getting it explained. And it is just fun to spend time uh, in that little piece of the Star Wars world. You know, seeing Massa Meta moving around the Senate. I'm here for stuff like that. It's cool. Uh, I thought episode 12, The Outpost, that's probably the episode of the season. You know, that's where Crosshair goes on a mission to a frozen world. And that's where he fully breaks bad from his allegiances with the Empire. You know, I want to shout out my friend Steve, who compared that episode favorably to Zuko alone from Avatar The Last Airbender. I think that's a really astute comp in terms of what narratively that episode is serving for Crosshair. So that was really effective. Uh, loved that. Uh, it was cool to see Clone Commandos. It was cool to see the Zillow Beast come back in you know and i think a bit of a unexpected synergy between the bad batch season two and the mandalorian season three you know seeing kind of both sides of the coin but seeing like the empire's ed palpatine's like contingency plans and like the lead up to the first order interest in cloning the strand casts snoke all that stuff is almost being like colored in and set up on these two shows not the primary focus of either show but it's like a it's a it's an aspect of both those shows you know who would have thought that we would have the sequel trilogy gaps be filled in by the mandalorian bad batch i wasn't necessarily expecting that to happen but it, it's, it is kind of cool to see that you know in terms of our actual characters here you know i think you get a lot of uh growth from the omega character as she has like grown up and matured a bit Omega, I think, is a, is a stronger, more well-rounded character, more fun to be with in season two, which is kind of common. You expect that we know with child characters in general, whether it's animated, whether it's live action, whatever it is, it's it's common to expect uh, child characters to 
take a little time to find themselves. Also, the batch themselves, you know, Echo leaving and kind of having different priorities than the rest of the squad was interesting. And they did a really good job with Tech in terms of making him a bit more than just this, you know, nerdy archetype. You know, it's kind of teasing romance, him starting to see things in a different way. And they really make you hit that in the finale when, you know, spoilers, you know, Tech seemingly falls to his death and dies, sacrificing himself for the squad. That was a really moving moment. You know, shout out Tech, RP Tech, Plan 99. If he is, in fact, dead, I think it was a really f- effective sacrifice, you know. You had Dr. Hemlock, the villain, show his crumbled glasses. They were barely crumbled, though. Is that supposed to suggest that Tech didn't really die? I'm not going to be shocked if they bring him back to life. Maybe Saw Guerrero saved him or something. I don't know. But I think they should kind of keep him dead. It's like a really effective death. I'd support that, but I wouldn't be shocked if he comes back. Um, I thought the stuff on Pabu was pretty cool, pretty interesting, just kind of different vibes. Seeing the Batch just be out of their element or out of, out of the, the normal element and doing different stuff is fun. Um, you got the Krennic cameo at the end, of course, Saw as well. Enjoyable. Yeah, like I said, ultimately, filling in the lore is fun. I enjoy the hang with with the guys. This is not a show that really has the means to reach the highs of Rebels or Clone Wars, but I think that's okay. Like, it's just kind of a show we vibe with, we enjoy. Um, now, before we know it, you know, we have Star Wars Celebration end of the week. I assume they'll announce Bad Batch Season 3 officially at that time. It isn't yet announced at the time of recording, but I think that's a pretty safe bet. And before we know it in May, uh, Star Wars Visions Season 2, the anime series, will be back. Can't wait for that. And of course, Mandalorian's still on. We'll get Ahsoka in the fall. Skeleton Crew's been filmed. The Acolyte is uh, in production right now. Star Wars on TV is very strong, very healthy. You know, the movies... We're still waiting, you know, Stephen Knight recently attached to the film Damon Lindelof left with this film, again, rolling through directors on the film front. Uh, We only can wait with bated breath for something to actually move across the finish line. But TV is at least, I think, scratching the itch and the Bad Batch helps a lot in that regard. But let me know, how'd you feel about the Bad Batch season two? Did you think it was better than season one? I did for sure. And what are you most looking forward to seeing in season three? And for more Star Wars, more movies, more TV, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.